Recall that if you mapped the distribution of earthquakes on planet Earth, that they were not in any sort of random pattern. Rather, they were in very specific places. You're looking at um, that same sort of map. They call it here seismic events. It's earthquakes. And every dot represents a place where an earthquake has occurred. And notice the prominent linear features, especially the ones that are in the middle of the ocean basins. Again, recall that from seismology, we learned that the Earth has very profound layering that goes from the surface of the Earth down to the center. The center being very hot. There's lots of high heat there, which escapes by traveling upward as convection cells similar to what's shown here. Now here they kind of show several loops going up, or it could be uh, long continuous loops of heat flow from the core to the surface. Doesn't matter. It's releasing heat from the lower, hotter areas to the upper, very cold areas. And if you have the broken plates of lithosphere at the surface, as shown by this distribution of earthquakes, then each of these large broken pieces of lithosphere is going to move around because of this convection process. When we map this on the surface of the Earth, we get a view like this. So a map of the world doesn't have all the uh, continents and oceans and things that you as sort of a member of the general public know. It's the plates. So for instance, there's North America, the green area. We live sort of right about where my cursor is going right now uh, by what becomes the Great Lakes. And notice we are dead center in this thing. And the edge of the plate isn't the coastline. So it's not where Boston and New York City and Washington, D.C. and Miami and Houston are. It's halfway out into the Atlantic Ocean at the Mid-Ocean Ridge. Same thing with South America. The edge of South America isn't the edge of the uh, continent where it meets the water. It's way out there. Uh, in the middle of the Atlantic. And so it's these plates that are moving around, not the continents as uh, Alfred Wegener described. When you look at this map, you look notice all the different colors. Wherever you see two different colors meeting, that is where two plates are meeting. We call that a boundary. And there's several different types of boundaries that we can think of. And what they have to do when we name them is, what are the two plates doing at that boundary? Are they moving towards each other? Are they going away from each other? That's sort of the simplest descriptions of motion you can make between any two objects going towards each other or away from each other. And we're going to start with the first one going away from each other. We call this a divergent boundary because the plates are diverging. And you just got to know a whole bunch of different facts about this. First of all, it's caused by what we say is tension stress. Notice I have the two little arrows pointing in opposite directions. Tension literally means, um, in, a, in a physical science sense, the pulling apart. So it's a force, a stress that's pulling things apart. And that is the place where we are creating seafloor spreading. The two um, asterisks there, notice we uh, I call that the fingerprint or the signature of a divergent boundary. Wherever you have these things, there is extensive basaltic volcanism and many, many, many what we call shallow focus earthquakes, meaning breakages in the earth very near the surface. Look at these two cartoons and any cartoons. You know, different artists from different textbooks did these things, but a couple of things you see familiar. First of all, you see sort of a red, reddish color in the upper one here, red or yellowish orange here. That represents that high heat flow coming up from deep within the earth by convection. Notice too, you've got arrows pointing apart in this upper one, and then these big lavender arrows pointing apart in the lower one. Anytime you see arrows pointing apart on a geologic figure, map, diagram, it means that there is divergence there, that the Earth is literally pulling apart there. 
the upper picture shows a little bit better. You can see where the continuous layers of continental crust and upper mantle actually get broken and cracked and split as this is occurring. So you see the volcanic activity and you see the breakage, the earthquake activity. This picture is more a series of things that's happening. So in this one area you've got rising heat. It starts cracking and diverging and upwarping, as it says there, the crust. You notice the little smoky areas. These are areas of hot springs and geysers. If this continues, and remember, plate tectonics moves at a few inches a year, um, this area that's just starting to crack and break apart will ultimately make a giant rift valley as it's pulling it apart you'll get active volcanism and still have the hot springs and geysers, all these evidence of high heat flow. Let it run for a few million more years and your valley becomes flooded with ocean water and now you've got a small little seaway. And notice in all of these figures you have the same arrows pointing apart different directions. That's that tension stress. And then finally they, have, they show a mature ocean basin. This would be like the Atlantic. The spreading has continued for millions of years, and uh, the heat flow continues, the earthquake activity continues, the volcanic activity continues, and the divergence continues. If we look at a map of the globe, we sort of see the linear features of the mid-ocean ridge running through all of the oceans. And if we look at these things and follow them, we can see those previous diagrams in different states of occurrence. Again, in geology, we can't really run experiments like we do in chemistry or physics. In geology, the experiments take millions and millions of years, and it's the Earth running the show. And so what we do is we go around the Earth and we look, say, for examples of this model, this experiment, in different stages. So first of all, if you look down the center of the Atlantic Ocean, well there's a mature ocean basin. It's a thousand plus miles wide, um, very big. Follow the mid-ocean ridge through the Pacific. We call this the East Pacific Rise and it shoots up here and reaches Mexico and sort of right here where I'm moving my cursor is the Gulf of California and that is an area that's still continually spreading and notice this is one of those immature little seaways it just recently opened up you could still swim across from one side to the other if you were a good triathlete um, and uh, and this is this stage in this ex in, in this early part of this experiment follow the mid-Atlantic Ridge down south as it whips around Africa into the Indian Ocean and then notice it curves over heading towards Saudi Arabia and enters up here by the Red Sea. The Red Sea is another example. See a small linear feature that is actively spreading so that Africa is going to be heading in one direction and Saudi Arabia in another. Uh, take a look a little bit lower farther south in Africa and you can see this sort of spreading center also shows a little split and heads down Africa here. These are the famous African rift valleys and there's um, active volcano uh, activity there. There are large rift valleys. Um, there's high heat flow. This represents a place where this spreading is going to split Africa apart but it's very early in the stage. The ocean water hasn't flooded in yet. And so going back to that previous slide, I just took you around the globe at places like all of these over here. Well, now let's zoom in back again at the Red Sea area as a good example of a divergent boundary. Uh, a map of it here again. So there's Africa, there's Saudi Arabia, there's the Red Sea. A view from a satellite. You see the ocean has flooded in here, covering it up. And now let's zoom in to the northernmost part of the Red Sea. The spreading center is actually right here in the central part of this lower blue water body. To the left side, 
the west side is the country of Egypt. There's the Nile River flowing up and the Nile Delta. To the north, this body of blue is the Mediterranean Sea. This sort of triangular piece is the Sinai Peninsula. Israel would be up here, Saudi Arabia would be up here. And this area is splitting. And also, it has bifurcated such that these two areas are splitting as well. Now, if we actually sort of zoom in and go down to the ground, right about where I'm moving my cursor here, and then look across this way, you get this view. So there's the water, but look in the distance. The mountains are black rock. If we were to go up there and sample it, we'd see it is basalt. Then look at the shapes of these mountains. Notice that they're sort of angled on this right side of the diagram. They're angled where they're facing up this way. And then on the left diagram, they're angled facing up that way. These are places where there's active faulting and breaking. And these mountain ranges were once together, but now they've split apart. So that's your example of a divergent boundary. And that's probably the most important one that we'll talk about in this course. But there is another big one, too. If you have places where crust is created, you have to have other places where crust is destroyed. And that's our other situation where we have convergent boundaries. And these are places where different crustal pieces, crustal masses meet each other. So the first one that I want to talk about is a place where continental crust meets oceanic crust. Now notice here I've made the arrows different. They, instead of pointing away from each other, they point towards each other. This is an example of compression stress. Compression stress is where forces are ac acting to push objects together, push pieces of matter together. In this case, the pieces of matter are large plates. Well, it has a fingerprint too. It also has volcanoes and earthquakes. But it's different. You can't just memorize, oh, plate boundaries have volcanoes and earthquakes. Duh. Uh, this has a different type of volcanic rock. It, it's where we have andesite erupting. Andesite is a very different rock. The classic example, look at the name. The word has Andesite. It's the rock of the Andes, the classic locality being the Andes Mountains of South America. And we also have a difference in the earthquakes here. They are still shallow, but then we have moderate depth, and in fact, we have the deepest earthquakes that we have on planet Earth. What happens here, instead of having a mid-ocean ridge, we have two other big ocean features that we call a subduction zone and a deep ocean trench. So in this diagram, several things to notice first. So first notice that there is this one on the left side, there is this piece of oceanic crust, and you can see the blue ocean on top of it. Remember that lithosphere is the oceanic crust plus a huge chunk of the upper mantle. And so this whole thing here that's gray and yellow, it's brittle, and it's moving this way. Somewhere way off on the left side of the slide would be a spreading center, a, a divergent boundary pushing it here. On the right side of the diagram, you see continental crust shown in green, but also with this underlaying um, uh, layer of upper mantle. So collectively, this is the lithosphere. Notice that we have the two large black arrows pointing towards each other, meaning that there is compression stress. These two things are going together. And when they get pushed together, if you have oceanic crust and continental crust meeting, the normal thing that happens is a process we call subduction, meaning the heavier, more dense matter will be forced underneath. Remember that oceanic crust had a density of about 3 grams per cubic centimeter, whereas the continental crust had a density of about 2.7. It's lighter. It floats. And when these two are pushed together, the heavier one sinks. And that's what you see with this curvature of oceanic crust and lithosphere being forced down into the earth. The other thing you see here, there's that color again. See these little blobs of red here. As this plate goes down, it starts melting away, and it percolates up. And as it does so, it, it 
sort of partially melts part of this lithosphere, part of this continent, and it erupts out as these active, very explosive, um, dangerous volcanoes over here. And it's different because you're not just melting basalt again and spewing out more basalt. You're melting basalt plus a bunch of um, continental crust as this goes up. And so it's kind of a mix. It's not an exact mix, but it's kind of like mixing basalt of the oceanic crust. Granite of the continental crust gives you a cocktail mix of andesite up here. Here's the actual map. So here's South America shown on the left. The little pink stripe would be a slice, a cross section through that west coast of South America. And then there it is in the center and you can see it. There's the oceanic crust being thrust downward. Everywhere you see a little black dot, that's where earthquake occurs. So notice they're shallow, but they're also moderate depth and they're way down here. They go as deep as this plate goes. This plate doesn't just curl around forever. At some point, it actually melts. But as long as there's a solid here, there's going to be potential for breakage and earthquakes all the way down. So earthquakes, subduction zones. Subduction zones also create deep ocean trenches, these giant deep canyons in the ocean. And then there's that heat remelting that oceanic crust here, melting through the continental crust, and then popping up through the Andes Mountains as the majestic uh, active volcanoes that they have there. Here's just another cartoon of a convergent boundary feature. So again, you have the arrows pointing towards each other. You have the oceanic crust subducting. You have the melting and creating of heat and volcanoes here. But here there has been, sometimes it generates so much heat down here, the, the, the friction of this plate going down, the remelting, that it creates enough heat here that it creates what we call a back arc basin. It starts spreading a little area back here again. Uh, Japan would be a good example of this. So the island area that, and land area you see in the middle here are the um, islands of Japan. Here's the deep trench. You've got a plate moving from the right side of the slide to the left side, it gets subducted. Deep ocean trench generates the volcanoes of um, Japan, but also enough heat was generated to create this back arc basin down here. There is another flavor of convergent boundary that we need to talk about. Uh, it's easy to imagine the continental crust meeting the oceanic crust. One gets forced under the other one. But what if you have a piece of light continental crust meeting light continental crust? Two continents bumping into each other. Well, there's no density difference, so one doesn't get subducted. Instead, you generate huge, huge mountains. So this is still compression stress. We're still forcing things together. You'll still see the arrows pointing together. In general, once you've consumed all that oceanic crust that's sort of between the two continents, the volcanism stops, but you still have extensive earthquake activity. And this generates super high mountains, the classic examples being, well, our biggest mountains on land, the Himalayas, the Alps. And that's what this cartoon is showing. You've got two chunks of oceanic crust. Notice the black arrows pointing together, the white arrows pointing together. There was subduction. They did close a whole ocean basin, but it's gone. And now you're jutting up against each other, two chunks of continental crust. The net result is a huge upward thrusting of mountains. Again, here's a photograph of the majestic Himalayan mountains where India has crashed into the rest of Asia pushing forward and generating these high mountains. So if we go look at all the different types of um, plate boundaries, we've got divergent at the top. We've got convergent here in the middle. And then there is this other lower situation uh, where, notice, the, the follow the arrows. If you don't have plates pulling apart, diverging, pushing together, converging. What if they're just grinding past each other? 
that is important in some places. So the San Andreas Fault in California is one of these. But for us in Earth history, this is going to be minor, so I'm not going to really test you over this one. Um, but if you understand these top two, divergent, convergent, and then the characteristics of the, each of them, what type of volcanic activity, what type of earthquake activity, what type of rocks are formed there, what type of stress is there, and be able to recognize it if you see diagrams on an exam, you'll do okay.